So welcome uh, back uh, to this uh, LH uh, virtual conference uh, organized by Medea. Hello to everybody on this globe. Uh, good morning or good evening, wherever you are. Uh, my name is Robert Fischer and I'm the scientific director of uh, Medea. And uh, together with my friends and uh, other distinguished uh, scientists, uh, next please. Uh, I'm uh, um, responsible, uh, we are all responsible for uh, the contents and the scientific work of uh, Medea. So it's our pleasure today um, to uh, present uh, the second uh, expert meeting on the two topics that you have seen before. And uh, just to remind you, uh, at the end of this meeting, you will have a possibility to click on a link on the bottom of your uh, screen uh, where you have to fill in a survey. And after that, you can uh, download a certificate uh, for the CME accreditation. Next. Uh, you can ask questions and you can use the question and ask uh, form uh, on, on your screen, on the right side of your screen. You can type in the question, we can see it in the uh, chat room and uh, we shall uh, forward your questions uh, during um, the discussion uh, to the presenter. Next. And uh, this expert meeting will, uh, like the other ones, uh, will be available uh, on playback uh, on uh, this uh, www.lh2020.education. So you can uh, the next days go and look at it. I also want to remind you that we still are open uh, to receive abstracts for you from you. The deadline for the submission is the 24th of October, so it's the next Saturday. And the two winning abstracts will be presented online uh, during the closing ceremony on the 14th of November. And uh, finally, I want to acknowledge again our grantors. This program is made possible thanks to independent educational grant received from Healthcare Business uh, of Merck in Darmstadt, Germany, but also an additional contribution from GE Healthcare. And uh, I also want to introduce you to my colleague, uh, Professor Carlo Alvigi, who will uh, join us uh, a little bit later on uh, during uh, this meeting and uh, will moderate together with me uh, the questions and answer sessions. We are uh, audience from 64 countries and more than six, 860 have registered uh, to this uh, meeting, virtual meeting. As you can see, uh, more than half of you are um, very uh, long expert uh, experience and more than uh, 10 years. And uh, most of you are very busy and we appreciate the time you are taking from your busy clinic and uh, practice. Uh, to stay with us and uh, to do this medical education uh, programs. Next. Just to remind you for the next expert meeting, so on the 24th, uh, there will be another expert meeting. And uh, again, on the 31st of October, the 7th of November and the 14th of November, well, we shall at the end also have our uh, closing ceremony of this virtual LH meeting. Next, please. So let's uh, join now first our first expert uh, today. And this is Professor Sandro Esteves. And uh, before I ask uh, Professor Esteves, um, to summarize uh, his presentation that you have been able uh, to see and listen uh, during the last days online. I just want to remind you that uh, you can ask questions uh, during uh, uh, his uh, summarizing or during the Q&A time. But also you will see on your right side um, a case study that uh, Professor Esteves uh, uh, prepared for you with uh, two important questions. 
and uh, you can answer those questions at any time uh, during the discussion. At the end of the discussion, uh, we shall uh, um, have uh, comments uh, by uh, Professor Esteves to the answers that we shall show you uh, from the pooling of the results. Now, to introduce Professor Esteves, uh, I will need a whole lecture. But uh, in summary, Professor Estevitz is a medical director of Androferge, which is Andrology and Human Reproduction Clinic in Campinas in Brazil. And he's very well, well known, especially for his male infertility and microsurgery activities, but also activities in reproductive endocrinology and IVF technology and quality management. He is professor at the University of Campinas, but also is a professor at the University of Aarhus in Denmark and a clinical research associate at the American Center of Reproductive Medicine in the Cleveland Clinic Foundation in the US. And he is very well known to you for many papers, uh, book chapters, and of course, uh, many uh, conferences uh, where he presented uh, his work. So it's really a great pleasure, Sandro, to have you here with us today. And uh, I would like to invite you now to summarize um, the uh, lecture that uh, you have given to us on male infertility and the role of LH in male infertility. Please, Sandro. Thank you very much, Robert. Uh, I would like to greet everyone uh, who are with us today. It's a, a great pleasure also to be co-chairing this meeting with Robert, Carlo Alvigi, and Peter Humayden, and having so uh, well-known speakers participating in the program. So my, uh, it's a great pleasure actually to be part of the team and also to discuss male infertility. So I was very uh, happy with the opportunity to have a topic on male infertility uh, in this meeting. And uh, I hope you had had a chance to see my presentation that I will summarize very briefly uh, during these next five minutes. So I think the most important aspect in terms of physiology is that uh, we need to remember that spermatogenesis is regulated by the two hormones, like in the female uh, side. We have also on the male side, FSH and LH, and these hormones are very important. So the Sertoli cells are the niche for spermatogenesis in, in the testes. So the Sertoli cells is for the male, what is the granulosa cells are for the female. So when uh, LH actually is not produced by the Sertoli cells, LH is produced by the Leydig cells, uh, sorry, uh, testosterone is produced by the Leydig cells uh, by LH stimulation. So, you know, so the stimulation by LH goes directly to the Leydig cells and then testosterone will be produced then testosterone will go inside the Sertoli cells, bind to the androgen receptor to actually support spermatogenesis. So intratesticular testosterone is made available under the action of LH. So LH is crucial for production of endogenous testosterone and intratesticular testosterone is key molecule for sperm maturation. So I mean, maturation of round spermatid spermatids to mature sperm, which is called spermiogenesis, is highly dependent on intratesticular testosterone. FSH is also very important. FSH actually will, we have FSH receptors at the sertoli cells, and FSH primary function is to increase sperm quantity in synergy with intratesticular testosterone. So while intratesticular testosterone is important for maturation, FSH is important for cell proliferation. So this slide shows you uh, that we can achieve, let's say, uh, intratesticular testosterone production by giving either HCG or LH. Uh, 
classically, in male infertility treatment, we overcome the problem of deficient testosterone production by giving HCG. And we know that uh, HCG and LH, they bind to the same receptor. So classically, due to the availability of uh, HCG and also recombinant HCG, we are able to provide these patients with a uh, molecule which has long half-life. And then when we give HCG, and then you can see in the X, uh, axis of this graph, there's an increase in testosterone production. But we can also achieve increase in testosterone production by giving LH, uh, specifically recombinant LH, which it has made available more recently. So the Lydex cell function can be, let's say, supported by uh, both recombinant LH and HCG. So uh, in male infertility, there are some conditions that we can consider LH-based gonadotropin therapy. I mean, we need to provide treatment to increase intratesticular testosterone production. So a classic example is like the hypogonadotropic hypogonadism that can be congenital or acquired. In this situation, there is a deficient production or action of LH and also FSH. Both are very low, so we can replace. So how we can replace? We can give LH itself or HCG. The other condition that we can consider uh, giving medication, gonadotropin therapy, is actually patients with intrinsic spermatogenesis impairment in quantity or quality. For instance, non-obstructive azospermia patients. So these patients usually have very small testes and a condition of hypogonadism, I mean low testosterone production. So despite having base, high baseline FSH levels, we could actually improve, let's say, sertoli cell function by providing LH-based gonadotropin therapy to actually increase intertesticular testosterone production and eventually having sperm in the ejaculate or more likely to increase success rates of sperm retrieval. So the therapy is primarily aimed to boost intratesticular testosterone production with the final aim of restoring or at least optimizing certain cell function. So the evidence that we have in the literature is not very robust. Uh, the number of studies are limited. We have more studies in hypo-hypo men and in hypogonadotropic hypogonadism male patients. Treatment restored spermatogenesis. This is very successful in up to 90% of patients with a uh, reported pregnancies in up to 65%, both natural or assisted. For the hypo-hypo patients, sperm count is usually higher when we combine both HCG plus FSH versus HCG alone. So, but we don't have actually randomized controlled trials comparing drugs and regimens. What we know for sure is that providing replacement and then increasing intratesticular testosterone production in combination with FSH is actually providing good support for spermatogenesis in hypo-hypo patients. For non-obstructive azospermic patients, the evidence comes overwhelmingly from observational trials and case series, suggesting that gonadotropin therapy might increase sperm retrieval success and in some cases allow return of sperm to ejaculate. In this category of patients, the best candidates include this hypogonadal man, I mean, man with total testosterone measured in the peripheric blood below 300 nanograms per deciliter, also Kleinfelter syndrome patients. But again, there's a lack of randomized controlled trials comparing regimens, doses, and also treatment versus non-treatment. So what we do in our clinic, and this is the last part of my summary, 
is we created a uh, a program which is called individualized testicular gonadotropin therapy that I uh, named this acronym ITESGO, in which we make the diagnosis hypo hypo or non obstructive vasospermia. We define then the hypo hypo if it's congenital adult onset. The non-obstructive azospermia, the same, the same, let's say, stratification we have for hypergonadotropic hypogonadism or normal gonadotropic. And then we provide regimen basically using HCG and FSH in different doses and regimens with the goals of, in the first category, hypohypo, to have sperm in the ejaculate for allowing natural pregnancy or pregnancy by IUI or IVF ICSI. In the second category, non-obstructive azospermia, the goals are to increase int intratesticular testosterone levels and keep the levels under, let's say, safe limits. We cannot go beyond, let's say, 1,000 nanograms per deciliter because too much testosterone could be detrimental. But the final goals will be to increase sperm retrieval success or eventually allow some patients to have sperm in the ejaculate. So this is my summary. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to share these aspects of a, uh, male infertility and gonadotropin therapy, specifically looking at LH and testosterone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sandro. And happy to see all of you. And uh, it's very important for us to learn more about male infertility because even if we don't treat directly patients it's crucial for us to have uh, information for managing together with the andrologist apple as a whole so i think that robert if you have any comment we can go on with the with the questions yes i think we can start with the questions now there are yes and the uh, first question I can see here uh, is what is the main rule of LH in the spermatogenesis? And what are the main infertility scenarios to consider LH-based gonotrophin therapy? This is something you, you mentioned, but probably you can focus a little bit more on this. Yeah, well, I can. Thank you very much, Carlo. It's a uh, pleasure to see you again. Uh, and. Uh, having the opportunity to discuss male infertility with you guys. Well, I think the most important uh, key message that we have for age is that age will be the driving force for testosterone production. And intratesticular testosterone, as I said, is crucial for spermatogenesis. Uh, one important message I want, I want to give is that we should not replace, uh, let's say, low testosterone levels in uh, male infertility patients by giving exogenous testosterone. We should never do that because then we create supraphysiological testosterone levels that will shut down the hypothalamic uh, pituitary and then FSH and LH will go down dramatically and as a result, Intratesticular testosterone levels, which are essential for spermatogenesis, will be very low. So replacing testosterone, and I see a lot of doctors, including urologists, giving exogenous testosterone to male infertility patients is a big mistake. We should give a drug that actually go to the Leydig cells would be LH itself or HCG to boost intratesticular testosterone production. So, because testosterone, as I said, is key factor with FSH to support spermatogenesis. So the scenarios will be, as I said, a patient with hypogonadotropic hypogonadism that we don't see quite often in the clinic. In our clinic, which is a referral center for male infertility, among the azospermic population, only 3% of our patients are hypohypo. But what we see a lot, and it's among the azospermic population, 
over 60% have non-obstructive azospermia, and half of them have hypogonadism. I mean, they have small testes, low total testosterone levels, and high FSH. This is the classic picture of the patient with non-obstructive azospermia. In these patients, we could consider giving some sort of LH-driven testosterone production, I mean, with an HCG or LH itself, to increase the chance of sperm retrieval. And this is one of the protocols that we use at the moment with a um, reasonable success rates in terms of improving uh, the uh, chances of finding sperm, specifically when we use the microdissection testicular sperm extraction. Sandro, uh, you have shown uh, in your slide um, that uh, LH and HCG uh, can have an LH activity effect on the Leydig cells. And uh, HCG was, of course, uh, producing more testosterone, which we expect because we know that it is uh, having the pathway of steroidogenic activity. But uh, in the female, we see a difference in the quality of the oocyte and the follicles. Uh, uh, between LH and HCG, and I think that Professor Sante will collaborate on that a little bit later. But uh, do, do we see in the male a difference of the sperm quality uh, mm -hmm. by using HCG or pure recombinant LH? Well, this is a very interesting question that we don't have the answer, Robert, because we don't have studies actually uh, using recombinant LH uh, in, in, in the male adult. We have case reports only. Uh, and then we have studies in uh, patients with hypogonadotropic hypogonadism diagnosed in, in, in pre-puberty, I mean, neonates. And then we have some studies. For those patients, the uh, treatment is aimed at increasing testicular size. Uh, let's say if the patient has, the child has cryptorchidism, bringing the testes down and also increasing the, the penile uh, size. So in, in the studies looking at recombinant LH, in that patient population, the results are quite, quite significant, quite good. But obviously we don't have, uh, let's say, uh, information about sperm quality. So we still don't know, but uh, obviously it will be very interesting to look at the effects of LH as the molecule driving testosterone production compared to HCG in future. It's not clear to me. But uh, we had a uh, large use of amoxifen in the past in patients with low testosterone. And uh, what is the state of the art? Because I still see some andrologists that use it when testosterone is low. I can understand that the aim is to move central pituitary gonotrophins, but is it for patients that have uh, men with the mm. higher estradiol levels? Does it work? Is it well, this is a in which population? Very, very important point. First of all, if the patient has hypo hypo, there's no point at all to use any sort of tamoxifen or clomiphene citrate. So if the patient has hypogonadism in terms of let's say total testosterone is low, then you can try actually to push the system to release more FSH and LA. And then it has been shown that it will increase testosterone uh, levels. The only problem is that patients have side effects uh, with this medication. This is one, uh, let's say, uh, drawback. And the second drawback, Carlo, is that to about 25% of these patients will trepass the ceiling testosterone levels. So, I mean, too much testosterone is detrimental because then again, you will kind of inhibit the pituitary, creating, it, let's say, iatrogenic hypohypo. So it's very important that if any doctor wants to prescribe, let's say, a less expensive medication, oral medication, as, as you mentioned, we need to kind of monitor the patients closely because 
uh, one every four patients will go uh, will have very high testosterone levels that will if this the treatment is for infertility and then it will be detrimental if it's for hypogonadism for let's say uh, a hypogonadism symptoms like low libido and other issues well this is not a problem but obviously if the uh, target is treating infertility then we need to kind of pay attention on the ideal range testosterone range that goes from 300 nanograms per deciliter up to 800 nanograms per deciliter or if you use nanomoles per liter it's like from 11 up to around 30. question from uh, the audience about the association of epithelium to the treatment that you clarified and the dose according to different scenarios so probably you can focus a little bit more on this specifying for how long when we can say that we are satisfied of when starting when to start and you mention it and when to finish so if the patient has hypogonadotropic hypogonadism we need to uh, consider two situations. If it's say a child onset hypo hypo, we need to combine both HCG and FSH from the start. And treatment usually lasts for six months and over in terms to restore the spermatogenesis. So if it's adult onset hypo hypo, we can start with HCG alone. And after restoring, let's say, the testosterone levels, and if the sperm quantity is not enough, then we add FSH. Usually, I add FSH 150 units twice a week, and then treatment lasts for about six months. So this is for the hypo-hypo. For non-obstructive azospermic patients, the idea uh, is to... Uh, the, uh, the doctor has to consider that these patients have low testosterone levels usually, and then the natural choice will be to give LH or HCG. Uh, most often doctors prescribe HCG, but when we increase testosterone levels, what happens is that the FSH levels, baseline levels, which were high in non-obstructive azospermic patients, because the testosterone levels starts to go up, it inhibits the pituitary, so FSH levels go down. And this is important for reset the receptors at the Sertoli cells. I mean, uh, these non-obstructive azospermic patients, they have satura saturation of FSH in the circulation, and there's down regulations of these receptors in the, in the Sertoli cells. So it's important to restore, let's say, the equilibrium, starting with HCG. So a group of patients, when we do that and they achieve ideal testosterone levels, then FSH levels goes below 1.5 international units per liter. So that's the point to add FSH, to keep FSH levels around three international units per liter, four, which is important to kind of support spermatogenesis. So this is how I do. I play with the medication according to the patient response respecting the physiology as much as possible. We have other questions, but time is running. And so probably we, we will have the possibility to discuss later or together, but now uh, we have to show results. So can we show results? Yes. So how many how many days does it take? No, no, this is the wrong uh, question. Uh, please, please show the, the right one. Yes. Okay, so Carlo, do you want to, to read the case? Uh, yes, this is this is the case. Please. So here we have a couple, primary infertility, seven years of infertility, female is 32 years old and with regular periods. Male is 35 years of age and uh, the history is characterized by azospermia, normal genetics, small testes, 
FSH, uh, 15 international unit per ml. Uh, uh, testosterone is two, um, mm, 280 nanogram per deciliter, BMI is 24.3. So what is, in your opinion, the likely diagnosis? So we have uh, four options, idiopathic obstructive azospermia, hypogonotrophic hypogonadism, idiopathic not obstructive azospermia, spermatogenic failure, and transient azospermia of unknown origin. So 64% of uh, people replied idiopathic, non-obstructive azospermia. So, Sandro, can we comment? I think it's a... Yeah, this is the correct answer. Yeah, just pay attention that the patient has small testes, high FSH levels, and low testosterone levels. So when we have this situation, an uh, infertile patient with the triad azospermia, small testes, and hypergonadotropic hypogonadism, hyper because FSH is high, hypogonadism because testes and testosterone low, these patients have spermatogenic failure. So it's non-obstructive azospermia due to spermatogenic failure. That's great. So we can go on. So, again, a couple primary infertility. I think the same no, couple. This is, this, is, uh, this is the same. Yes, it's uh, the a question is now about the treatment. <laughs> okay, so I will avoid to read again all the, all the, the scenario. So now we are talking about uh, the same couple, and now we have to move to treatment. Four options, combination of antioxidants and aromatase inhibitors, injectable testosterone, only FSH, and association of ACG plus FSH. And it's incredible that is one of the few situations where 100% of participants replied the association of ACG plus FSH. So I think that, uh, I don't think we need Comment, but Sandra, if you want to say something just for a further underline. Absolutely. So, yeah, infertile, these patients they benefit from amyotropin therapy before sperm retrieval. So, treatment is usually started with HCG to boost intratestacular testosterone production. Then, FSH is added later in the course of treatment uh, when FSH levels drop to below 1.5. Five, as I said, so optimal spermatogenesis is achieved, in my opinion, when FSH and LH even testosterone will work in synergy. The only important thing to remember is that replacement therapy with exogenous testosterone is prohibited as resulting in supraphysiological testosterone levels that will shut down the pituitary and then worsening the clinical features. So, thank you very much, Sandro, uh, for. Uh, introducing us and highlighting us the importance of FSH and H uh, in the different scenarios of mere infertility and also explaining and uh, clarifying uh, treatment possibilities uh, for these couples. It was indeed a pleasure to have you with us today and we hope to see you in uh, within the next uh, sessions because uh, you will have another presentation as well. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Have a great weekend, all of you. And it is now my pleasure to introduce uh, the next uh, uh, speaker and presenter, Professor Daniele Santi. And Carlo, can you please uh, introduce uh, Daniele? So it's a pleasure for me, and I think that Daniele is a very well-known scientist, famous for his studies. And uh, just to summarize, because the, the, the CV is very long, so what we can pr propose is just an abstract. Daniele obtained his PhD in clinical and experimental medicine in uh, 2017 from the University of Modern and Reggio Emilia. 
And currently was as an assistant professor at the unit of endocrinology at the same university. He has published a large number of scientific papers in peer-reviewed journals in the field of uh, endocrinology, obviously andrology, reproductive medicine. And um, so he also had uh, uh, awards as a uh, young investigator, one very important in 2015. Currently, his research are involved in uh, environmental and epigenetic influ influences um, on hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis in the male and in the rule of the gonotrophins on human reproduction. He's also very famous for the so relevant trials he conducted in the group of Manuela Simoni concerning the polymorphism of gonotrophins and their receptor. And it's a pleasure for me to introduce Daniel, Daniele. And Daniele, the web is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carlo. Thank you, Robert. And thank you all to be here. So uh, just uh, a, a, brief, uh, a brief summary of my talk that uh, I hope uh, that uh, you had the chance to, to, to follow the, the presentation. Uh, my talk was uh, about uh, the role of isoforms and polymorphisms of uh, gonadotropins in uh, human reproduction and in particular in uh, uh, female infertility and so in controlled ovarian stimulation phase since uh, as you know uh, the control ovarian stimulation phase is very variable and the aim is to personalize the treatment to the human characteristics and so <clears throat> the role of pharmacogenomic the role of polymorphism could be very useful to personalize the treatment in front of the woman considering the human characteristics. So I just prepared two slides uh, with the most important take on message, I think, of my presentation. And the first is about pharmacogenomic. Just to remember you, what is pharmacogenomic? And pharmacogenomic is the evaluation of how the polymorphism could influence the pharmacological response. And so it, it is clear that uh, it is very important to know how polymorphism could influence the stimulation during a controlled ovarian stimulation phase in assisted reproduction. In my talk, I show you that, uh, uh, in particular, the FSH receptor gene was very fully uh, evaluated in terms of uh, polymorphism. And uh, in particular, three polymorphisms are well uh, known to be able to influence the sensitivity of the receptor and the number of the receptor. And so the potential response to the FSH stimulation of the exogenous FSH. And so uh, we uh, try two years ago uh, to uh, point out uh, which is uh, the knowledge, the, cur the current knowledge about the pharmacogenomic applied to the clinical setting. And with Carlo, we published in Human Reproduction Update this uh, large meta-analysis in which we considered all studies in which the result of controlled ovarian stimulation, so the result of assisted reproduction, uh, were evaluated uh, considering all known uh, polymorphisms of both FSH receptor and FSH beta gene. And it is very interesting that uh, we found that the, the three FSH receptor gene polymorphisms are significantly, as uh, summarized in, in this table, uh, are related to the duration of the stimulation protocol, to the number of oocytes retrieved, to the number of metro oocytes retrieved, and to the FSH consumption. And uh, in particular, when the wild type, haplotype of this three polymorphism is present, there is a, a better result in terms of oocytes, metro oocytes, and uh, there is the need of a shorter stimulation and a lower FSH dosages. So, so far, currently, we have, I think, enough uh, evidences in the scientific literature that could help us to include these polymorphisms in the evaluation of the better protocol to be applied to, to the women and to, to control the variance stimulation phase. So this is the first take-on message that 
I want to stress and to, to remember to you. And the second uh, uh, was about the different action of a legend ACG. Sandro uh, tell us uh, uh, before that uh, LH and ACG are different. I show during my talk that LH and ACG are clearly different at molecular level. And uh, this is quite a, a new result, quite a new discovery, since uh, we, for many years, uh, consider LH and ACG similar since they act on the same membrane receptor. But we now know that uh, uh, LH and ACG act and activate the same receptor, but the receptor is activating in a different way by the two molecules. And in particular, ACG is more potent and activate those pathways involved in cyclic IMP and in the activation of gene involved in steroidogenic and proapoptotic stimulus. On the contrary, LH is less potent on cyclic IMP, but is more potent in the activation of those pathways involved in proliferative and anti-apoptotic pathways. So it is clear that the action of LH and ACG at molecular level is very different. And we try to summarize what we know about the clinical application of LH and ACG in the setting of assisted reproduction. So considering uh, uh, the uh, application of uh, and the comparison of FSH alone with FSH plus LH or ACG or human menopausal gonadotropin that as you know, is a mixture of FSH, LH and ACG. And uh, here in this uh, final figure, we summarize the result uh, showing uh, all uh, uh, outcomes that we evaluated from the all sites on the left to pregnancy rate on the right. And you could see that when we had LH or human menopausal gonadotropin, so when we had LH activity to the FSH stimulation, we obtain a, a few number of all sites compared to the use of FSH alone. But when we use a LH, you could observe that this difference is a progressive loss. And finally, we have a better and higher pregnancy rate when we use FSH plus LH. And this is not uh, uh, the same case when we have, uh, uh, when we use ACG. In, in, instead, uh, uh, indeed, uh, uh, ACG, the addition of ACG to FSH does not change uh, the result. And so it is clear that the action of LH in the ACG is different at the clinical level, and the addition of LH improves the quality of your sites that we retrieve. So probably the, the potential application of LH is very, very relevant. And in the near future, we should uh, focus on the potential role on the uh, beneficial role of a LH in, in this stimulation. So this uh, were, were my take home messages and I hope that you uh, have a follow my, my, my talk. Thank you again for, for the invitation and thank you again to be here to discuss with you. Thank you, Daniel. A very, very clear, efficient, so very important information provided. So I think that we can um, move some questions that, in my opinion, are very intriguing and just having a look. So one question is from the audience. Can a late supplementation overcome a polymorphism affecting the FSH receptor? And we hypothesize a mechanism of dimerization of gonotrophin receptors. So, very good question. Thank you. Uh, very good question and very complex question. Uh, starting from the dimerization of gonotrophin receptor, uh, yes, uh, this is what uh, we are doing to, to discover, we are doing to, to, to evaluate. Uh, since uh, it is uh, very complex, this, uh, this evaluation, we should remember that uh, all the uh, evaluation, all the discovery about differences about LH and ACG at molecular level have been obtained uh, in, uh, in vitro models. And uh, so this is not the in vivo, not what we have in clinical practice. And so 
uh, we should remember the model in which we search, and it is very difficult to, to study the, the potential demineralization, but it is possible. Uh, considering the first question, so the LA supplementation, I think that uh, in some cases, uh, LA could overcome the, the polymorphism, but uh, we have, uh, we still have not so many studies in, in this setting that uh, uh, are able to uh, answer to this question because uh, there are not so many studies uh, evaluating the pharmacogenomic. And uh, we should also consider that uh, there are also polymorphisms on the LH beta, on the LH CG receptor that could influence also the action of LH. And uh, Carlo, well known this and uh, published uh, several works on, uh, on this setting showing that the, the addiction of uh, LH to FSH should be very useful when a particular polymorphism of the LH beta gene is present. So we should. Uh, uh, have I considered that uh, a single polymorphism could be not enough to answer uh, and we should consider that there is a mixture and the complexity uh, picture of polymorphism and not only probably of gonadotropins but we should consider also estrogen and the other polymorphisms. So the clinical setting is clearly more, more complex than what uh, I showed you so, uh, a few minutes ago. Uh, this is a very <laughs> complicated scenario because I remember the historical studies by Marco Filicori and he clearly demonstrated that following an FSA priming, the last stage of follicular genesis can be totally sustained by a leech. So this is something that is also present in human species. So uh, I think that memorization is a very good hypothesis. But another crucial aspect is probably that the two receptors, even if uh, separated, probably have some possibility of convert and counteract each other after uh, receptor level, but transduction levels. So it has been proven in some other species. Thank you very much, Nina. For and, I, mean, uh, uh, I do have a question to you. Um, Concerning uh, the more important uh, FSH receptors, and you mentioned three of them that uh, can be of uh, importance, uh, are you or can you comment if there is overlap um, uh, between uh, these uh, different uh, polymorphisms? So if you have one polymorphism, you might have uh, other ones as well. Uh, does anybody or from your work, did you come across information on that question? So, yeah, uh, in particular, the, the three polymorphisms on the FSH receptor are uh, two are all uh, within the exon 10 of the, the, the gene of the FSH receptor, and the third is on the promoter region of the gene. It is very interesting that the two on the exon 10 uh, are in linkage to this equilibrium. So, it means that once the first is present, the second is present too. And so we could consider these two polymorphisms together. So we, do, uh, uh, we should consider the same result when we have one or the other. And uh, so we could uh, uh, reduce the, the number of uh, polymorphisms to be evaluated to two in the FSH receptor. Uh, there is no correlation of these two polymorphisms with the polymorphism on the promoter region. So we could have uh, a, a woman with the one polymorphism on the exon 10 and the other on the region, on the promoter region. And this is a, 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 a further complexity because we should consider the complexity of both of the two polymorphisms yeah. and, uh, and the combined action on the FSH receptor. So, very good. And um, I don't know if we have time for other questions or uh, if we have to move to the results. Probably we can have another question. And uh, or the question is related probably with, with what we are going to discuss later. Are FSH isoforms different in terms of biological activity and not life? Okay. <coughs> so the, I, I remember during my, my talk, so during the the recorded talk that uh, FSH uh, is usually and physiologically 
produce in, in a mixture containing both hypoglycosylated and hyperglycosylated isoforms. And uh, the glycosylation clearly influences the, the, the action, but not only the action of the molecule. Indeed, the hyperglycosylated isoform show a higher weight, show a longer half life, but a lower bioactivity. And on the contrary, hypoglycosylated to show a stronger bioactivity but a shorter of life. So it is very interesting to remember this difference and to observe how physiologically the menstrual cycle and the photography show a clear different prevalence of these two isoforms during the physiological menstrual cycle. So, Carla, maybe, yeah. This is something emerging from all the association studies that some polymorphism can be, can have an impact, even relevant at the heterozygote state. So, what do you think that for some polymorphism, the difference between heterozygosis and homozygosis is more relevant? Uh, or probably heterozygosis is sufficient for the phenotype at the least in control I think that uh, uh, it is difficult to, to understand because uh, we should also consider the, the both all polymorphism and also homozygosity and heterozygosity. However, the, the real problem and the real challenge in this trial is to enroll enough patients with the homozygosity of the polymorphism that is usually uh, show a, a lower uh, prevalence. And so it's very difficult to, to observe a differential clinical role uh, between homozygosity and heterozygosity also for the different sample size needed to observe these differences at, at clinical level, I don't think, not at molecular level, in which the, the heterodiagnosis could have a, a difference or an intermediate uh, action compared to the homodiagnosis one. So the, this is something, for instance, at least in the, some experience I had in the past, I don't know in the mail, but for instance, when we did the studies about the late beta subunit polymorphism, the impact of homozygosis is dramatic, it's different from the heterozygosis. The impact of heterozygosis is there, but you, you need larger simple size to realize it. So it's not the same for FSH receptor 680. My, just my feeling yeah. is that heterozygosis is, a, is more uh, impacting than expected. Yes, it's a, and uh, I don't know if in the male it's the same. Is my curiosity is um, uh, I have not experience of this link with means. Okay, I think we shall need uh, to solve that problem for the future, and now we shall yes. start uh, solving uh, the result of the questions uh, that have been uh, shown uh, and the answers. So, so here's. The first question, uh, do FSH isoform physiologically change during the follicular phase? And uh, two thirds of you answered for C, which is also the correct answer. And uh, Daniele, would you like to comment on that? Yes, this uh, is... Uh... This is what we observe in physiological uh, menstrual cycle and it is... Uh... Uh, very interesting. The, the, the C answer is the correct. Indeed, we know that uh, in the first phase, we we in the first follicular phase, we have more acidic isoforms, and so they hyperglycosylated compared to the late follicular phase, in which we have hypoglycosylated isoforms. So, suggesting that during the uh, physiological menstrual cycle, we require a different action. So. Uh, 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 shorter and a uh, more potent bioactivity of the FSH in the late follicular phase. And uh, it is very interesting. Also, uh, always uh, uh, remember that uh, this is uh, the, the um, physiological phase and not what we observe in controlled ovarian stimulation phase in which we are searching a multifollicular growth and not a 
only one follicle growth as in, in the physiological menstrual cycle. Okay, can we have the next one? So the next question was, do FSA trisophones influence the gonadotropin by your activity? And here I think uh, you were influenced and uh, had a very good uh, success in your presentation. 100% answer the right uh, question. Now, do you want to comment on that as well? Yeah, no, I, I already uh, anticipated the, the question, so it is good that the, that the answer is correct. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, um, for being with us today and sharing your experience and knowledge that we all appreciate and opening for us a bit of understanding how a uh, function of the gonadotropins, FSH, LH, the receptors, the isoforms, and the difference between them. And I think it was a great contribution. No, it's uh, for me. No, nothing to add. So it's uh, for for us. It was a very nice opportunity. For I think that it's very crucial in our field interaction among different angles. Having the possibility in the same session to discuss with andrologists, with endocrinologists, reproductive medicine gynecologists is a uh, and uh, i do hope that we will have uh, more involvement of embryologists in this because only multidisciplinary approach can give us the possibility of growing during sessions like this in the daily in, in the daily clinical practice so i do think sandra stevis for this window he, pro he gave us on the the big issue of male infertility because it's very important in the treatment of the couple in both uh, as a unique entity, so male and female, because it is crucial for the right treatment. And I think, Daniele, for this very nice uh, say, um, talk turning the rule of pharmacogenomics, we fight it a lot for this, and I don't know why there is a still a little resistance in our community. So we have a polymorphism that makes us resistance to <laughs> the idea. Well, polymorphism of the clinicians. Polymorphism of the clinicians. <laughs> so we have to force the polymorphism or we have to find another way to make this kind of approach for you. So I thank all of you and uh, I was I'm very happy about this. Everything. Okay, thank you, Carlo, for your uh, closing remarks. And I have nothing to add to that, only some housekeeping information. And uh, that will be just reminding you again uh, uh, to um, at the end of this session uh, to click on the link uh, on the bottom of your uh, of your screen uh, to uh, reach the CME uh, uh, survey and uh, download your CME certificate. And just to remind you of, of next activity and the next expert meeting will be on the 24th of October, uh, looking on uh, presentations um, uh, by Sandra Stevis again, and Carlo will also present us and both presentation will be on the Poseidon uh, 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 subgroups uh, and uh, explaining to you on the groups by itself but uh, also on treatment possibilities. So with that, thank you very much uh, for all of you and also at, uh, for the technicians and for uh, Chloe and Antonietta for helping us uh, in the background. And uh, we hope to see you next uh, meeting. And until that, please stay healthy and safe. And please send your abstracts. You are still in time for sending the abstract and, have, and having your presentation at the end of this uh, this meeting. So the deadline is 24 of October. So.